come with me now on a journey not only of sight and sound but of mind, but mainly sight and sound. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination where we discuss Sega Model 3 arcade games and the Sega Dreamcast. What the fuck went wrong? If you were the owner of a Sega console back in the late 1980s through to the mid 1990s and beyond, there was one thing that you could normally always rely on, and that thing was that if you waited long enough, you were normally guaranteed that your favourite Sega arcade games would eventually get a home port. And as the years went by and the home console hardware got progressively more powerful, the enticing prospect of playing perfect versions of your favourite arcade games at home began to seem less like fantasy and more like reality. But as the home consoles got progressively more advanced, so did their arcade counterparts. So just at the point I was enjoying practically arcade perfect versions of 2D games on my Sega Saturn, so the arcade still managed to stay one step ahead with impressive looking 3D polygon titles that still look significantly more impressive than their home versions. And then, the Sega Dreamcast happened. This was the point I felt I had a home console that had finally caught up to what the arcade could do. The Dreamcast was capable of producing incredible looking games that seemed light years ahead of the games that came out on the previous generation's consoles. And the prospect of getting my hands on some nearly arcade perfect versions of the Sega arcade games that were around at the time seemed almost too good to be true. Which is funny, because that's exactly what it turned out to be. God damn it, Sega! But we're getting a little ahead of ourselves here. I think in order to really set the scene, in terms of what I was talking about with the Sega arcade games that were around at the time, a little bit of context is needed. And anybody who's a regular subscriber to my channel will know that I love arcade racing games. So let's just have a quick look at how arcade racing games have evolved from the 1980s right through to the mid-1990s where we left our story. 
So things had moved on quite considerably in the arcade by this point. Now let's not forget though that at home I was still playing something that looked like this. So is it any wonder then, when in 1996 I walked into an arcade, that my mind was suitably blown when I saw this. Running on Sega's at the time brand new Model 3 arcade board, Scud Race looked like nothing I'd ever seen before. The speed of the gameplay, the clarity of the textures, I mean, you're racing through an aquarium with fish and dolphins, for God's sake. Not long after this, I discovered even more Sega Model 3 arcade games, like Daytona USA 2 here, a sequel to one of my favourite arcade races of all time. And much like Scud Race, Sega had gone for some equally outlandish settings for the races to take place in, such as an amusement park, complete with its own roller coaster and all sorts of other weird shit going on. And also a racetrack that's set within a biodome. Even my favourite film franchise got in on the action. With a spectacular looking for the time, Sega produced Star Wars Trilogy arcade game. <laughs> Le Mans 24 was another Sega Model 3 arcade racer that included dynamic changes from night to day, and also changes in weather as well. Sega Rally 2 was another Model 3 continuation of an existing Sega racing series, and I can remember back in the day being particularly impressed with how the reflections in the glass looked back then. That was unlike anything I'd ever seen in a game before. So let's fast forward back to the year 2000 now. The Sega Dreamcast has been available in Europe for one year, and a 24-year-old Mr Thundering decides to finally give in to the temptation to buy one, confident in the knowledge that although they haven't been released so far, surely all his favourite Model 3 arcade games will come out on this mighty behemoth of a console, in nigh-on arcade perfect form. I mean, that's what happened with every Sega console so far. So of course ports of Scud Race, Daytona USA 2 and Star Wars Trilogy Arcade will appear, right? Unfortunately not. 41 year old Mr Thundering is still waiting for this to happen. I mean, what the actual fuck Sega? I finally had a console that could actually do these games justice and you're not gonna fucking port them? Of all the games that I mentioned, only one of these ever saw the light of day on the Dreamcast. And Sega managed to fuck that up as well. So what exactly went wrong then? Why didn't these games appear on the Dreamcast? Now this, unfortunately, is where we have to enter the realm of conjecture, because the actual reason behind this mystifying decision is known only to Sega themselves. So let's have a little look at some of the theories out there, starting off with the top results if you type Scud Race into Google. And whilst we're here, allow me a quick moment of shameless self-aggrandizing by pointing out the fact that the number two result for Scud Race in the entirety of Google is a video that I made myself back in 2013. But that's enough ego stroking from me, so let's just scroll down on the SegaRetro.org website and see what reasons they've put for why the game never actually came out onto the Dreamcast. <laughs> 
So they mentioned that Scud Race was actually originally due to be ported to the Sega Saturn, but bearing in mind that the Saturn could only just about handle ports of the original Daytona USA and Sega Rally, eventually development was moved over to the Sega Dreamcast. Sadly though, a full conversion of Scud Race was ruled out very early on, as apparently Sega wanted to avoid a reputation of only offering arcade ports to Dreamcast customers. But tantalisingly, it does also go on to state that elements of Scud Race were used in early Dreamcast development kits as a way of showing off the machine's graphical power, and apparently these early Dreamcast development kits known as Katana, only worked at about 40% of the power of the finished Dreamcast, and these give us the best idea of what a finished version of Scud Race would have looked like on the Dreamcast. Let's have a look at it. Every time I see that video I get so frustrated at the thought of what could have been. It's almost cruel to think that we were that close to a version of Scud Race for the Dreamcast and it just never happened. SegaRetro.org go on to explain as well that unlike Daytona USA, the BPR Global GT series which Scud Race was based on no longer existed as a sport after 1997, which may also go on to explain why Scud Race was never bought to home consoles. I've also seen it mentioned on an internet forum that Sony owned the license for Porsche around this time, which would have made it tricky for Sega to release a conversion of Scud Race, but not impossible. Because let's not forget that Sega have got round this problem before, when re-releasing versions of Outrun by simply changing the car a little bit to stop it looking like a Ferrari. So this would have been an option available to Sega, if they were in fact serious about releasing the game, but wanted to get round the issue of using licensed cars. I think changes in the way that Sega wanted to be perceived, and hence wanting to avoid a reputation of only offering arcade ports to Dreamcast customers, is probably the argument that holds the most weight for the absence of Model 3 games on the Dreamcast at its launch. Reeling off the back of the commercial failures of the Mega CD, 32X and the Saturn, 
And with Sony capitalising on the huge success, brand awareness and momentum of the PlayStation 1, Sega were desperate to try and claw back some of the market and change the public perception that they were struggling. And it's arguable that no amount of arcade ports were going to change that perception. But to me, completely ignoring some of your strongest arcade games that were around at the time feels like throwing the baby out of the bathwater. Surely a strong lineup of original titles and incredible arcade ports would have been the way to go. I mean, for me as a consumer, the main point of owning a Sega console was to be able to play the latest arcade games at home. I have a pet theory, based purely on the empirical evidence of what I observed in my friend group at the time, that sales of the Sega Saturn were negatively affected by game stores using the original Saturn version of Daytona USA as a demonstration game when the Saturn was first released. The game was rush released, and as a result it looked terrible, with tons of on-screen pop-up, and it ran at a measly 20 frames per second, complete with big ugly black borders at the top and bottom of the screen. And this was the game Sega were hoping would encourage people to spend £399 on this brand new system. An absolute fortune back then. When I asked one friend, who I'd enjoyed lots of games of Daytona in the arcade with in the past, if he'd be getting one, he said no. When I asked him why, his answer summed up the game quite succinctly. It looks shit. So how gratifying would it have been, just four years later, to have seen a near arcade perfect 60 frames per second version of Scud Race running on a Sega machine that had just launched at £199. Now I get that the gaming world was a different animal in 1999 than it was in 1989 when the Mega Drive launched, but what I'm saying is, surely having some arcade perfect Model 3 ports available when the Dreamcast launched surely wouldn't have hurt. And the Dreamcast did end up getting its fair share of arcade ports as it basically shared the same architecture as the Sega and Naomi arcade board. This meant that arcade titles such as Ferrari F355 Challenge, Crazy Taxi and 18-wheeler American Pro Trucker could and were ported with relative ease. Unfortunately though, these were arcade titles I could not have given two shits about. I'm not criticising these games, I'm just saying that they personally did nothing for me. On the plus side though, we did end up getting some excellent ports of other Naomi games that I did like, such as House of the Dead 2 and Marvel vs Capcom 2. These games were no substitute for the Scud Race shaped hole in my Dreamcast collection though, and that Scud Race shaped hole was equally mirrored by the lack of Daytona USA 2. But the story of Daytona USA and the Dreamcast is one where again things take a little turn for the bizarre, because in the year 2000, Sega decided that they were going to re-release the original Daytona USA on the Dreamcast, which would have been a perfect opportunity to perhaps make a hybrid version of the game with the original Daytona USA tracks and then also featuring the tracks from Daytona USA 2. But instead of doing that, Sega decided to reuse the tracks from the Saturn version of Daytona USA Championship Circuit Edition and then include three brand new and distinctly inferior tracks to the ones that featured in Daytona USA 2. Now Daytona USA 1 and Daytona USA 2 do have slightly different styles of play, but how much cooler would it have been if we'd ended up with three tracks based on the Daytona USA 2 tracks in the Dreamcast game, rather than the five tracks that we actually end up with? I know which version of the game I'd much rather have been playing. <laughs> 
described the five extra tracks in Daytona USA 2001 as being not as good as the ones from Daytona USA 2, I don't by any means mean that they're bad. And I don't want you to get the wrong idea and think that I don't like Daytona USA 2001. I actually think it's a great game. I really, really like it. And playing the game on the emulated D-Mule using my racing wheel, it actually handles incredibly closely to the arcade original. So much so that it's actually possible to keep the game in sync with a game of Daytona USA 2 played on Model 2 emulator using the original arcade ROM. Funnily enough though, it's actually taken until I could play this game on an emulator using my racing wheel that I've actually become a fan of it. I wasn't a huge fan of it back in the original Dreamcast days because of the fact it was so hard to control using a joypad. And the version that I had was even harder to control because it was the Japanese version which didn't have a load of additional sensitivity options that were later added to the Western versions of Daytona USA 2001. Now, I feel I should probably just add here, I hadn't gone out of my way to get the Japanese version. I'd picked up a copy of the game from a market seller in Bangkok back in 2001. The game itself was obviously bootleg, but the price was so cheap that I thought if I'd ended up buying a dud, I didn't really care, it was worth a shot. And amazingly, when I got home, it did actually turn out to work. And not only that, it turned out to be the Japanese version, working absolutely perfectly on my UK PAL Dreamcast. And although trying to play the game back then was probably more frustrating than enjoyable because of the overly sensitive joypad, I was still incredibly impressed by just how good this game looked. And with its big, bold, colourful, shiny graphics, 60 frames a second, and those all-important Sega Blue Blue Skies, even though we've got an Azure one going on here, I think this is the closest looking game on the Dreamcast to a Model 3 racer. Let's compare it to a bit of Scud Race. And next, let's compare a bit of Daytona USA 2001 to Daytona USA 2. Now it's at this point of the video that we need to address the elephant in the room, because you're probably thinking to yourself, oh wait a second, there was an actual Model 3 racer released for the Dreamcast. So let's do this thing. Let's talk about Sega Rally 2 on the Dreamcast, and why exactly I hate it. Yeah. 
Now in order for this to happen, shit has got to get real. And I actually mean this in a quite literal sense, because what this involves is digging my actual Dreamcast out of storage and hooking it up. Now the issues with Sega Rally 2 on the Dreamcast are something that I've talked about briefly in another video where I compared the arcade version, the Dreamcast version and the PC version to each other. So let's just have a little reminder of what those issues are and exactly why I find Sega Rally 2 on the Dreamcast to be so egregious. The biggest issue is that Sega Rally 2 was developed using Windows CE. The Dreamcast ran an optimised version of Windows CE as an operating system, with the theory being that developers could use this instead of the proprietary Sega one if they were more comfortable programming games in Windows. Now, as I understand it, the issue with this, as was explained to me on the Supermodel forum many years ago by one of the main developers, was that Windows CE was being used to more or less emulate the PC version of Sega Rally 2 and was therefore not taking full advantage of the hardware the way that most other Dreamcast games could. SegaRetro.org go on to mention that Sega Rally 2 was one of the first Sega Dreamcast titles to be announced and was supposed to demonstrate that the Dreamcast could match and exceed the Model 3 board's capabilities despite only costing a fraction of the price. Its early announcement, however, led to the game being developed in tandem with the hardware, leading to an arguably rushed product that doesn't take full advantage of the system's capabilities. Hmm, now where have I heard this story before? The Japanese version of Sega Rally 2 is one of the first console racing games to aim for and regularly hit a 60 frames per second refresh rate. However, the frame rate is significantly compromised in busy scenes, and often just when turning around corners. However, the PAL version that we got in the UK is locked at 30 frames per second and lacks a PAL 60 refresh rate option, meaning the game is played permanently with black borders. There was, however, a code that you could input at the title screen that enabled a 60 frames per second mode. The code basically cuts out unnecessary special effects and terrain features such as eliminating trees from the maps and removing the dust and water trails coming off the car. You can see a video of the two modes here, side by side, but owing to the limitations of my RGB SCAR capture device, the change in frame rate won't really be super noticeable. I never knew about this code back in the day, which is a shame because if I had then perhaps I might have got a bit more enjoyment from the game. And perhaps I'm being overly hard on it, because despite its visual flaws it was a solid release in terms of content, with an additional 12 stages on top of the arcade's 4, 
equaling a total of 16, with further choices of weather effects and a 10-year career mode, and a much larger roster of cars. But the point I've been trying to make is that the game was visually gimped through a combination of the use of Windows CE that didn't take full advantage of the Dreamcast power, and the fact it was rush released. Now this was why I got my actual Dreamcast out of storage for this video, so that I could do some comparisons between Daytona USA 2001 and Sega Rally 2 using the actual hardware and not emulation. Now one of the first things I want to draw attention to is Sega Rally 2's poor draw distance. The way the detail in the background seems to appear out of nowhere from a sort of misty haze, a problem that Daytona USA 2001 doesn't suffer from. So let's have a look at the two games now, running side by side to see how they stack up against each other. Both running on the original hardware, both captured using the same capture device. Just to appease my own sense of OCD somewhat, I am going to enlarge the Sega Rally 2 footage to get rid of the black bars on either side of the screen. Try to stay low in them turns. As well as the improved draw distance, all the cars in Daytona USA 2001 have got additional lighting effects applied to them, giving them all a nice shiny sheen, and they just generally look crisper, more detailed and better defined in my opinion. The cars in Sega Rally 2 look a bit drab and flat by comparison, but I will give the game a little bit of leeway here, due to its additional effects where the cars get muddier and dirtier as the game goes on. I feel the background graphics in Sega Rally 2 also seem to have a generally grainier appearance, although due to the RGB SCART video capture that I'm using here, that probably isn't really coming across very well. And let's not forget the final kick in the teeth to UK and EU gamers, with the fact that the version of the game that we got was further visually hampered by being locked at 30 frames per second, with those aforementioned ugly black borders being ever present. So I'm using Daytona USA 2001 there as my main comparison point because of the fact that I think it is the game that looks most similar to a Model 3 racer. But there are actually loads of other racing games on the Dreamcast that all look miles better than Sega Rally. All games that are running at 60 frames per second with no issues with the rubbishy draw distance or just generally crap looking graphics. So as equally upsetting as I find the lack of Scud Race on the Dreamcast, particularly after the tech demo, and the lack of Daytona USA 2, it's equally annoying to think that we could have got a version of Sega Rally 2 that could have looked so much better. I mean, just look at this game here, Tokyo Extreme Racer 2. It looks absolutely phenomenal. And as for those other two Model 3 games that I mentioned right at the start of the video, again, who can really say for definite? Sega did actually have some previous history with regards to Star Wars games and home conversions of their arcade titles, with the 1993 Sega Model 1 game Star Wars Arcade being one of the launch titles for the ill-fated Mega Drive add-on, the 32X. So could licensing issues have been a problem? I'm not 100% sure. Bearing in mind that Sega had bought Star Wars Racer Arcade to the arcades in 2000, a game that was based on the pod racing scene from Star Wars Episode 1 that could be played in a first and third person perspective, which was running on Sega's Hikaru arcade board 
interestingly, another arcade board that was based on the Dreamcast architecture, but one that was significantly more expensive than the Naomi One hardware, but capable of producing far superior graphics. And this represents yet another Sega arcade racing game that stayed exclusively in the arcades and never got a home port. Now whilst I mentioned earlier that I didn't think licensing would be a problem as Sega were actually still producing Star Wars games at this time, all of these Sega produced Star Wars games were arcade only, and at the time there were other companies releasing home versions of Star Wars games, I think Acclaim had released a couple of Star Wars arcade racer games as well. Most of which, if memory serves correctly, were all pretty shit. But perhaps Sega and these other companies had some sort of arrangement with Lucasfilm, where Sega concentrated on the arcades, and the other companies were able to release games on the home consoles. Now in 1999, the Dreamcast did have its own home version of Le Mans, which was part of the Test Drive series, which was released by Infograms, never know how you pronounce that developer's title, and Melbourne House. So this may partially explain why we never got a home arcade conversion of Sega's own Le Mans 24. Sadly, I suspect that the simple reason for the lack of a home port of Star Wars Trilogy Arcade and The Man's 24 is pretty much down to the same reasons that we've already talked about before. A change in the Sega business model from previous generations, with what appears to be a conscious decision to move away from a reliance on arcade ports. But in spite of what sounds like Sega of the mid-1990s incredibly anti-arcade port stance, some other Model 3 games, along with Sega Rally 2, did receive arcade conversions, such as Fighting Vipers 2, Virtual On, and Virtua Fighter 3. So why did these games get conversions, and not games like Scud Race and Daytona USA 2? For this, I think part of the blame, so to speak, can be laid at the feet of a change in the paradigm of the collective gaming consciousness of the era. And this change, I feel, is directly attributable to one game in particular that appeared on a rival console to the Sega Saturn. Now, although other simulation-style racing games did exist before Gran Turismo, I feel that this is the one that really cemented the driving simulation series as a genre into the collective consciousness of gamers. And as the popularity of simulation style games increased, so I feel it started to sign the death knell for arcade racers. The original PlayStation 1 version of Gran Turismo was well received publicly and critically, and went on to become one of the best selling PlayStation games of all time. A fact that was sure to have not gone unnoticed by Sega, who are no doubt themselves keen to try and replicate this winning formula, and could perhaps go some of the way to explaining just exactly why they felt they didn't want to bring some of these arcade racers home. Fortunately though, all was not lost for Sega arcade racing fans, but this small glimmer of hope in an otherwise endless sea of simulation racing games came sadly after the demise of the Sega Dreamcast. When Sega arcade racing finally returned home with style, with the 2004 release of the original Xbox version of OutRun 2. Now, I've talked extensively about OutRun 2 before, in my previous video where I looked back at the whole series of OutRun over its 30 year history, so I'm not going to go into masses of depth about the game again here. But the thing with OutRun 2 is that as well as being one of the greatest arcade racing games ever to grace a home console, it also helped to provide a little bit of closure to those Sega arcade racing fans like me, who were still pissed off with Sega for never releasing home versions of Scud Race and Daytona USA 2. It had two bonus stages that were made up entirely of the individual stages from those two legendary Model 3 games, recreated in the OutRun 2 game engine. 
It's like someone had heard my plea to Sega of old to include the Daytona USA 2 stages in the original Dreamcast version of Daytona USA 2001. It's just that they were responding to the memo just a little bit too late. But to make up for that, they were also adding the Scud Race tracks into this awesome game as well. It wouldn't be until many, many years later that we finally got to play these Model 3 races at home through advances in emulation, initially in MAME and then later in the Supermodel emulator. And the road to playing arcade perfect versions of these games at home wasn't a straightforward one. My initial attempts to scumula uh, scumulate? <laughs> to emulate Scud Race in MAME uh, resulted in the game playing at about 1 frames per second on my old Pentium 4 processor computer. Scumulate, sorry I've lost it. You can see the game here running on that same Pentium 4 PC back in 2010, running a little bit faster than one frame per second. By purchasing some more RAM and getting a better graphics card, and also I realised that if I took the side off my computer and blew a fan into it, it actually got the game up from one frame a second to ten frames per second. Ooh. Things got significantly better with the introduction of Supermodel Emulator, a specific emulator for Model 3 games, where I was then able to get performance like this using the same PC and hardware. And then through improvements in the PC hardware I was using at home, and also improvements in the emulator itself, I was eventually able to go from this to this. A nigh-on arcade perfect version of Scud Race, right down to the fact it even supports force feedback when I play it using my racing wheel. I say nigh on arcade perfect because it's been so long since I've actually played Scud Race in the arcade, I couldn't tell you if there's any differences in how this looks to the actual real arcade game. About the only thing that's missing from the full arcade experience here is the ability to play the game in multiplayer. Now before I draw the video to a close, I just want to quickly go back to another Model 3 game which came out at the Dreamcast launch, and that's Virtua Fighter 3. And you can see the arcade version running in the background here, again using Supermodel Emulator, looking more or less arcade perfect. Now Virtua Fighter 3 isn't one of those titles that's ever been on my wish list of arcade games, which is why I haven't really said anything about it so far, but it is a very popular series and it did get a Dreamcast port, which is why I thought I should just add a little bit about it in at the end now. And I'm going to go back to our old friends at SegaRetro.org for a bit of further information here. So they mentioned that Virtua Fighter 3 garnered a great deal of attention upon its original arcade release in 1996, and throughout the Dreamcast development lifecycle, it was used as a rough guide as to how capable a new Sega system might be. However, the two year gap, 3 in the West, before a comparable home console outing, led to it being compared unfavourably to newer titles, such as the critically acclaimed Soul Calibur, which in the West was also a launch title for the Dreamcast. Whereas Soul Calibur is considered to improved upon its transition from arcade to Dreamcast, Virtua Fighter TB makes noticeable cutbacks in areas, despite being the older and simpler game of the two. This may be attributed to the fact that the Dreamcast port was handled by Genki and not in-house by Sega AM2, in contrast to the Saturn release of Virtua Fighter and Virtua Fighter 2. While operating at a higher resolution, Texture quality is often worse on the Dreamcast, and lighting and fog effects also differ between the two versions. Character shadows also do not always render correctly, as evidence in stages played on uneven surfaces, such as pies where the battle takes place on a slanted roof. Some stages have different coloured backgrounds for unknown reasons. So it wasn't just Sega Rally 2 that got a graphically suboptimal port at the Dreamcast launch. Now Genki were the company responsible for producing the excellent looking Tokyo Extreme Racer which we showcased earlier, but perhaps in these early days of the Dreamcast they weren't familiar enough with the hardware to get the best results out of it. 
Which makes me question the wisdom of Sega for letting a third party company work on one of its flagship titles at launch when they should have just got the mighty juggernaut that was AM2 to do it. I mean it's like they're intentionally trying to sabotage themselves. So let's do a quick comparison there with Soul Calibur to see exactly what SegaRetro.org were talking about. <laughs> So visually we can see that Soul Calibur is by far the better looking of the two games there. The characters in Virtua Fighter 3 have got a really obvious sort of look like they're made out of polygons as opposed to the lovely smooth body shapes, that sounds dodgy, uh, that the characters in Soul Calibur have got. But maybe Soul Calibur was just a truly exceptional game and Virtua Fighter 3 TV wasn't that bad. Let's have a look at another fighter to decide. Once again, this looks far superior to Virtua Fighter 3. I mean, just look at those graphics. Just look, uh, look at uh, those graph. Uh, just look at those graphics. Uh, uh. Nah, that's fair enough, Tina. I totally deserved you snapping my leg in half like that and then further kicking the shit out of me. So the point is that basically what we have here are two third party fighting games for the Dreamcast that both look way better than Sega's flagship fighting title Virtua Fighter. Is this not proof enough that Sega round about this time were really making some pretty fucking dickhead decisions? So on that bombshell, let's start wrapping things up now and seeing if we can start to draw any sort of conclusions out of any of this. So though I've spoken about a few games in isolation here, there were actually a whole slew of arcade titles which Sega never ported over to home systems. Over on the forum NeoGAF, one of the users there put together a very handy little graphical guide to all the games that never came out. And then as we scroll down a little bit further, there are others which also never got a look in such as one of my favourite arcade hack and slash games, Golden Axe The Revenge of Death Adder, luckily now playable in MAME. So Sega Model 3 and the Dreamcast, WTF went wrong. So with the games that did come out, such as Sega Rally 2 and Virtua Fighter 3, we can see that there were problems there with games getting rush released, or being produced by unfamiliar developers, or unfamiliar operating systems. But as for those games which never got released, such as Scud Race and Daytona USA 2, much like the list of all those other unreleased Sega games that we just looked at, the answer is, we'll simply never know. The conclusions that we can draw from the evidence available to us are that if these games didn't get released due to issues with licensing, then the most likely reasons are due to the way that Sega themselves wanted to be perceived as a company and their reactionary, often ill-advised responses to the perceived threat of Sony, which as a direct result meant that these arcade titles wouldn't ever find their way to a home system. With the arcade scene itself in decline, arguably from the late 90s onwards, and with the PlayStation brand at the height of its momentum, 
It's hard to say if having well ported versions of games like Scud Race, Daytona USA 2 and Star Wars Trilogy Arcade available at launch would have made any difference to the longevity of the Dreamcast. But I, perhaps somewhat wistfully, always like to think that they could have. Hello kids, it's TV's Admiral Akbar here. If you like this video, then make sure to like, share and subscribe. Why not check out some more of Mr. Thundering's Sega-related videos? It's not a trap! Ho 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 ho!